Well, let's now talk to political journalist and author Gerard O'Colman, who joins us from Paris this evening. Thanks very much for joining us again on RT International. You're in the French capital. What's the mood and atmosphere in the city right now? We're being told that there's a state of war uh, and a state of emergency. Uh, this, we've had this before, we had this in January, and for several weeks we had non-stop sirens and uh, non-stop chatter on the radio about the uh, threat from uh, radical Islam and uh, terrorist groups and so on. And so we're having a kind of a replay of that, but it has been, I think, accentuated, and we're going to have an intensification of the uh, media campaign, which is essentially a propaganda, a propaganda campaign to make people in France uh, fear uh, Muslims. Uh, we need to be clear about uh, the origin of the war on terror. The war on terror is, uh, I quote, orchestrated from abroad. These are the words uh, François Hollande used to describe this terrorist attack. Well, the attacks that have been uh, continuing to destroy Syria to uh, massacre its population have also been orchestrated from abroad. They were orchestrated by NATO and they've been carrying these attacks out against the civilian population of Syria for four years now. And this is a terrorist campaign that is also orchestrated from abroad. And people in Europe need to understand that there is a war uh, that is becoming global that is being waged against civilian populations in particular. It is a form of uh, neo-imperialism and neo-colonialism which uh, aims to divide and conquer uh, European and uh, Middle Eastern and African and the world's population for that matter um, and to, to make them submit to a global order that uh, does not serve the interests of most of the people on this planet but that does serve the interests of a very uh, few uh, ruling um, elite, a uh, very small, tiny, and particularly tyrannical ruling elite. There is no war on terror. There is a war uh, that is being waged using uh, proxy groups, terrorist proxy groups, and they are being used against uh, nation states who are resisting uh, US and uh, Israeli hegemony, and they are also being used as, uh, as a means of disciplining uh, the workforces in Europe. In a period of uh, mass unemployment and austerity, you now have uh, terrorist attacks being committed by terrorists funded, armed, and trained by Western intelligence agencies. There is no such thing as ISIS. ISIS is a creation of the United States. We know that from official sources of the US military themselves. Uh, declassified documents from the Defense Intelligence Agency have confirmed that. Many people would argue that the US actually saw the rise of ISIL coming and turned a blind eye or even encouraged it as a counterpoint to Assad. And a secret analysis by the agency you ran, the Defense Intelligence Agency, in August 2012 said, and I quote, there is the possibility of establishing a That's declared so or undeclared <laughs> Salafist, it's not secret anymore, it was released under FOI. The quote is, there is the possibility of establishing a declared or undeclared Salafist principality in eastern Syria. And this is exactly what the supporting powers to the opposition want in order to isolate the Syrian regime. The US saw the ISIL caliphate coming and did nothing. Yeah, I think that what we, where we missed the point, I mean, where we totally blew it, I think, was in the very beginning. I mean, we're talking four years now into this effort in Syria. Most people won't even remember. It's only been a couple of years. The Free Syrian Army, that, that movement. I mean, where are they today? Al-Nusra, where are they today? And what have, how much have they changed? When you don't get in and help somebody, they're going to find other means to achieve their goals. And I think right now what we have allowed is... Colin, you were we've, helping yeah, them in we've allowed this, we've allowed these extremist, were... you know, these extremist militants to come in. But why did you and, allow them to do that, General? Well, you were in those post. Are, you were the head of the yeah, Defense right, Intelligence right. Agency. Well, those I, are, those I, are I, policy I took liberty, I took liberty printing issues. out that document. Yeah. This is yeah. a memo I quoted from. Did you see this document in 2012? Was this come across your table? One oh, of your yeah, yeah, yeah. I paid very close attention okay. to all this. So when you saw this, did you not pick up a phone and say, what on earth are we doing supporting these Syrian rebels? That kind of information is presented and... And what did you do about it? Those become, I argued about it. Did you say we shouldn't be supporting these groups? I did. I mean, we argued about these, the different groups that were there, and we said, you know, who is it that is involved here? And I will tell you that uh, I, I do believe uh, that the, the intelligence was very clear. And now it's a, it's a matter of whether or not policy is going to be as clear and as defining and as precise as it needs to be, and I don't believe it was. Just on, just on what you're saying, just to clarify here, you're saying today, today my understanding is you're saying we should have backed the rebels. You're saying government, you agreed with this. We analyst. should have done more earlier on in this effort 
uh, you know, than, than we did. We, but we in really, 2012, we, we but in 2012, which was three years ago, let's just be clear, just right. for the sake of our viewers. In 2012, your agency was saying, quote, the Salafists, the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda in Iraq are the major forces driving the insurgency in Syria. Mm -hmm. In 2012, the US yeah. was helping coordinate arms transfers to those same groups. Why did you not stop that if you're worried about the rise of quote unquote yeah, Islamic I, I, extremism? I mean, I hate to say it's not my job, but that my job was to, was to ensure that the, that the accuracy of our intelligence that was being presented was, was as good as it could be. And I will tell you, it, it goes before 2012. I mean, when we, were, when we were in Iraq and we still had decisions to be made before there was a decision to pull out of Iraq in 2011. I mean, it was very clear what we, what we were going to face. Well, I admire your frankness very on this subject. Very clear what we were going to let face. Me, let me just, to, one, before we move on, just to clarify once more, you are basically saying that even in government at the time, you knew those groups were around, you saw this analysis, sure. and you were arguing against it. But who wasn't listening? I think the, I think the administration. The administration turned a blind eye to your analysis. I don't know the, if they turned a blind eye. I think it was a decision. I think it was a willful decision. A willful decision to go support an insurgency that had Salafists, Al-Qaeda, well, and Muslim Brotherhood. A willful decision to do what they're doing. Which, which you have to really, you have to really ask the president, what is it that he actually is doing with the with the uh, policy that is in place? Because it is very, very confusing. I'm sitting here today, Maddie, and I don't, I can't tell you exactly what that is. And I've been at this for a long time. Okay, well, let's go back to Iraq. I just want to ask you one right. last question about Iraq. Many would argue that the Iraq invasion was a recruiting sergeant for extremists and terrorists. You seem to have conceded partly that earlier on in this interview you said that I think it was, a, I think it was a strategic fire, I think it was mistake I think history will not be kind it but let me just get very mistake. specific on Iraq US prisons in Iraq are believed to have helped radicalize thousands of young Iraqis yeah. who passed through them Absolutely. Uh, not just through torture but through providing a recruiting ground meeting yeah. place a training facility for the very same militants yeah. that the US is now bombing I think 17 of the top 25 yeah, I, I, there's no, there's no commanders. doubt there's no doubt that the prison system that was that was the Iraqi prison system that became uh, you know, places, training ground, the, the, the training ground for what we're facing So it today. wasn't just 2003 that U.S. poured fuel on the fire. It was much later on as well. Well, I, US I don't think it was so much. It's not the U.S. so much. I, well, let, I, me, let me quote you, your former colleague, Major yeah. General Douglas Stone, who ran the U.S. Right, detention Stone, system right. in Iraq. He yeah. said he called the U.S. prison system a jihadi university that was breeding more terrorists. Yeah, I, I believe that. And he ran them. I believe that. I, it's I, not just the Iraqis, I, as I you just down, said. It's I, the Americans. I went down there. Well, I mean, what we did was we allowed... We allowed things to happen in those prisons, in those detention facilities, in, in Camp Copper and Camp Buka, to where guys like al-Baghdadi spawned, and others as well. You now have uh, terrorist attacks being committed by terrorists funded, armed, and trained by Western intelligence agencies. There is no such thing as ISIS. ISIS is a creation of the United States. We know that from official sources of the U.S. military themselves. Uh, declassified documents from the Defense Intelligence Agency have confirmed that. And the French are now, the French government is now attempting to drum up support for more military intervention in Syria. And what they want to do is they want to get in on the game. The game is almost lost. The Russians have routed much of the Islamic State. You now have Islamic State militants coming into Europe uh, disguised uh, as refugees. Uh, that will destabilize uh, Central Europe. And the French uh, government wants to, uh, to, to get in uh, on the game in Syria and prop up those so-called moderate rebels. There are no moderate rebels, of course, in Syria. There are uh, al-Qaeda and ISIS militants, terrorists who have been beheading people, eviscerating people, uh, absolutely creating chaos and genocide right across the region and this does not serve uh, this does not serve the Syrian people or, or, or anyone other than the Western corporate elites and their geopolitical interests what, what do you expect France to do now in the light not only of Friday's terrorism but 10 months on from Charlie Hebdo it's not going to ease up on what it's doing is it no. Uh, the, the, look, the, the, this it, it much depends on how the French public will react. Whether they, if they will, uh, we are being bombarded now with a uh, media propaganda campaign. It's just non-stop talk. Uh, we're told not to go out in the street. Uh, we're supposed to be fearful and and, and keep quiet and so on. Um, I think there is going to be a campaign against dissidents in France. They're very worried about um, the new media that has emerged in recent years, and they are very um, worried about the. 
alternative media. So I think there you will see, uh, we saw this actually after the uh, attacks in January, you will see a conflation of terrorism and uh, dissidents. So uh, one of the tools which uh, the media, the mass media uses to discredit any kind of rational questioning of the established order and particularly the war on terrorism is to uh, deride those who would question the war on terrorism as conspiracy theorists. And I think you're going to see a crackdown on so-called conspiracy theorists and websites that actually uh, publish rational and honest analysis of what is happening. So you're going to see more of that type of intellectual terrorism, which is already at a boiling point in France. I mean, it's got to the point now where you have um, professors um, in universities who are being intimidated. You have school teachers uh, who are basically uh, being fired for even suggesting that there may be a link between French imperialism and terrorism. There was one case recently, for example, of a, a school teacher who uh, almost like he's lost his job when he suggested there might be a link between uh, French foreign policy and terrorism. So you, we are going through a period of uh, deep uh, intellectual terrorism and, of course, these, uh, these random terrorist acts, which are a form of low-intensity uh, civil war. I think that the current crisis, the refugee crisis, which is really a form of coercive engineered migration because they could have easily have been prevented, this form of coercive engineered migration is going to make this a lot worse and it is going to create the conditions of civil war. It is a natural consequence, of course, of globalization, of financial capitalism. This is essentially what it leads to. I mean, it leads to a breakdown of society. And the only way in which they can kind of keep everybody down is by a uh, policy of divide and conquer. So you're going to see a situation where you've got a very much a Wahhabized working class in France. They're being Wahhabized by the allies of the French political elite, the Saudis and the Qataris. They're building Wahhabite mosques all over the place. Uh, and that is going to Wahhabize the youth, and they're going to be then used as pawns, if you like, in much bigger geopolitical wars, wars, proxy wars against Russia, proxy wars against Iran in the Middle East, and so on. And that is going to create massive social unrest. It's mm -hmm. going to divide working people uh, against each other. And uh, the only people who are going to actually benefit from this are the war contractors, the military industrial media intelligence complex. So in a, whatever way you look at this, I don't know who exactly did, uh, committed this attack and this atrocity, but uh, the real people who are responsible, whether directly or indirectly or consciously or unconsciously, is the French government, because they have been complicit in terrorism in the Middle East and all over Africa. And that needs to be understood. And if we don't understand that, this is going to continue and it's going to deteriorate. We will find ourselves in a situation under military uh, military uh, law, martial law, if this can continues. So pick you up it really the... needs to be analysed and understood. Can I pick you up on the issue of migrants and refugees? Because one of um, the terrorists appears to have been um, a French citizen, another a recent migrant to the country. What do you think this will do to France's policies towards the migrant crisis? Well, I think there is sufficient evidence to suggest strongly, in fact, that the current crisis, I mean, the, 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 the migration crisis is something that is ongoing. Uh, and there are different waves. You've got uh, different waves coming up from Libya. You've got the ones coming up from Syria and up through the Balkans. But the current re kind of refugee crisis, as it were, is um, what uh, I would refer to as coercive uh, engineered migration. This is a term used by Kelly Greenhill, a U.S. academic, who wrote an interesting book on this, uh, whereby she shows that uh, migration can be used as a tool from by one state to destabilize another state. In this case, it's definitely being used by the United States and Turkey to destabilize the Balkans, uh, Mitteleuropa, which would be uh, Hungary, and of course Germany. And the reason, the geostrategic reasons of this are basically go back to classical uh, geopolitics, which is Har Halford McKinder's theory uh, of the world, of dividing the world island. That is to say, you divide um, the Eurasian Peninsula. Uh, from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, you create an intermarium there so that you prevent German and Russian unity. And that is why Germany essentially is being uh, kind of overrun with, with people who are themselves uh, victims of globalization, but they are now being instrumentalized and used as weapons of globalization. And this is one of the key uh, contemporary strategies of U.S. imperialism. You use the consequences of globalization as further tools to further globalization. And um, I think there is not going to be, there is no policy in Europe to, to 
to control uh, immigration or anything like that. I think that the, the, key, the key question here is not actually controlling immigration. The key question is stopping this geopolitical destabilization of Europe. Uh, and uh, some countries are attempting to do that. Hungary is attempting to do, do that. Bulgaria is attempting to a certain extent to do that. Um, in other words, trying to find out who's an actual refugee and who isn't. They're prioritizing women and children, for example, in Hungary. Um, that's a rational approach. But of course, uh, it, Viktor Orban of Hungary is being demonized by the European Union for his insistence on implementing the uh, mm. laws of the European Union of, and of a Hungarian nation state. Here, you're, you're in a situation where the French government is totally uh, uh, subordinate to U.S. dictates. This is a country that has been completely taken over by U.S. imperialism, just as Germany. And France doesn't really have a foreign policy. It does okay. whatever Washington tells it to do. OK, it's um, always good to get your thoughts on this. Gerard O'Connor, thanks very much for joining us from Paris this Saturday evening.